Tonight we're going to look at some things continuing in the book of Nahum. Judgment is something that is very distasteful to most people. And I think it's because uh, we feel like as individuals and people who have these strong independent natures, I don't need anybody telling me what to do or how to live my life or make statements that are judgmental about what I do. In our country, we have a judicial system that that if you have a problem and you, you want to exhaust all of your avenues of recourse, you, you say, I'll take it up to the Supreme Court. I'll take my, my matter to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court, if it is an issue that is big enough, they will hear what you have to say. But they're going to... They're going to make their decisions based on a couple of things. One is their jurisdiction, whether or not they have say over this matter. And two, they're going to, or they're supposed to anyways, make decisions based on the framework that's created by the Constitution of the United States. That is the ultimate law document that that directs the affairs of our country. And, And in the same way, God has a jurisdiction, and he has a standard by which he judges the nations, and he judges his people as well. The jurisdiction is referenced in a couple of the verses that are written on the passage or on the on the screen, and, and that is uh, a couple of very important passages, first one being, Psalm 24, verse 1. That says, The earth and everything in it, the world and its inhabitants, belong to the Lord. So, what is God's jurisdiction? It's the world. It's it's everything that we see. A similar idea is found in Psalm 100, verses 1 and 2. Shout triumphantly to the Lord all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Acknowledge that Yahweh is God. He made us and we are his, his people, the sheep of his pasture. So, so that's God's perspective on, on really everything as it relates to the issues of, of human relationships that, that all of these are under fall under his jurisdiction because he created all that we see and all that we experience. His, his standard, I think, is found, is probably stated in a lot of places, but uh, a place where it's very, very plainly stated. And I think it's uh, Micah chapter 6. I think it's a statement that is... That it's, it's almost inherent in being human. We resonate with these words. These words resonate with us. Whether or not we know God, we, we feel like these things are important. Verse 8, chapter 6, book of Micah says, Mankind, he has told you what is good what, and what it is the Lord requires of you. To act justly, to love faithfulness, and to walk humbly with your God. Um, there is something about these that just resonate within the human soul. And I think it's because we're created in the image of God. Again, talking about his jurisdiction and his right to rule and to judge matters in our lives. And, and it is this reality that the people of Nineveh, according to Nahum, are going to have to face. So go with me to Nahum Chapter 2. Verse 1 says, One who scatters is coming up against you. Man the fortifications. Watch the road. Brace yourself. Summon all your strength. For the Lord will restore the majesty of Jacob, yes, the majesty of Israel, 
though ravagers have ravaged them and ruined their vine and branches. And we'll kind of read the passage as we work through it. These first couple of verses uh, state the, uh, it it gives us the judgment statement and and then the, the context. Um, The the judgment statement is strong. The one who scatters is coming up against you. This is a a statement of warning and a statement of judgment to the people of Nineveh. And they are encouraged to summon all of their strength because they're just not going up against um, the adversary across the river or anything like that. They're really going up against God. This is God's judgment on the empire of Assyria, specifically on their capital at this time, the city of Nineveh. We've noticed in some of what we've already covered through our study of the Minor Prophets, specifically through Jonah, that God gave Nineveh a chance to change course and change direction. But it does not seem that that had any lasting benefit to them or lasting value. And so the judgment then comes. I believe that's that's a way, though, we don't always see it from our perspective. And and even oftentimes uh, within our own national identity, if, um, if, if something tragic happens, uh, you remember when the uh, when the Twin Towers fell and, and that attack. Some people said it was God's judgment on America. And many people were very offended by that idea because uh, we're, we're America. That's, those things don't happen. And I don't know if it was or if it wasn't. Um, but I, I do know that maybe, do you think the people of Nineveh, after all the dust settled and the and the smoke cleared, that uh, that they read the statement by Nahum, and, and this was a prophecy, a prediction. You think they said, well, this is a judgment of God. You think maybe they were offended by that idea? How can God judge us? How can God uh, say anything about us? So it's it's interesting to see the global picture of God's involvement in the lives of all humans. He created everything. The world is his jurisdiction. The, the people of Nineveh and the people of Jerusalem are all his, under his jurisdiction. And so he says, brace yourself. You, they are a mighty and a powerful empire. Uh, they've lived according to their own rules and marched according to their own drumbeat. But now that's going to be called to account. Because even though they felt like they were making their own rules and doing their own thing and living according uh, to the rewards of those who have might and power, uh, they're under God's jurisdiction. But verse 2 gives, gives me a lot of hope. Because this is a statement of the context of God's actions. Uh, this, this is not to say that he necessarily, uh, someone might misconstrue what I say, and uh, when I say God acts on behalf of his people, uh, specifically uh, this is the, the people of, of Israel, the, the descendants of Jacob. Uh, but I believe it's a truth that, that any who call on his name are his people, the uh, people who wear the name Christian, uh, people who are following in the steps of the Messiah. Um, that's, that's God's people today. And, and it's, it's not, I don't think it's, it's designated by any people group. Like we, maybe at some point we said America is a Christian nation, uh, America as a Christian nation is very much off track. Is God going to act on behalf of America? Or is he going to act on behalf of his people, the Christian people? And so, uh, though uh, we may live in times of, of chaos, uh, and um, it's, it's kind of interesting... I, I think I checked out a couple of months ago. I don't know if anybody's with me on this one. Uh, I've been listening to 
a um, uh, it's called the Stormlight Chronicles. It, it's a, um, a mythological story, and uh, and I've been listening to it in my van. And so I've I've not been listening to the radio. I've I've not been paying a whole lot of attention to uh, to things that maybe I otherwise would have. And and every but every now and again I stick my head up to see what's going on. And I, and I just go back in my hole because things are still kind of chaotic and crazy. And, and we can get caught up in that and, and we can, uh, we can lose track of the fact that, that maybe we don't see it on the national scene that God is active, but God is still active and God is still wanting to work through the people who are under his, that acknowledge his jurisdiction. And live according to his standard. He, he still wants to act on behalf of those people. And he still will work through us. And through our actions. Uh, on, on, uh, on his behalf. And so, so he makes that statement. He said, for the Lord. Uh, summon your strength at the end of verse 1. For the Lord will restore the majesty of Jacob. So God's doing this thing over here. But it's for a purpose. Uh, for the the purposes of his his people, um, and uh, oops, go back there. So um, so this is our time frame right here. Uh, basically, here's here's Nam. Here's uh, the years that he is in. So I can't see the the numbers, but it's uh, uh, the uh, the destruction of uh, of Nineveh is man I can't see that I can't see those little dates um, it's 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 in this time period it's kind of during the toward the end of the reign of Josiah and 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 so during this time uh, God is occupying uh, the, these are the nations up here these is kind of God's people these are the nations up here God is occupying these people and they're having these battles and fighting against one another. So the, the Chaldeans, the Medes, of course the Assyrians are in there. And while all this is going on, uh, we, we see this young man named Josiah who comes on the scene. And um, if you want to be encouraged about the, the importance of one person of faith, read in Second Chronicles chapter 34. So if you go with me there. He is a young man. A very young man. Second Chronicles chapter 34. Is uh, where we'll read about the beginning of what's going on with Josiah. Um, his, uh, I guess it would be his uh, great grandfather. Hezekiah was was a great king for for Judah, for God's people. Then after Hezekiah comes Manasseh, and uh, Manasseh has that phrase that goes with him and the other kings that he did what was evil in the eyes of the Lord. Uh, His son Ammon reigned two years and was assassinated, and all of his house was... uh, uh, all of those who conspired against Ammon were killed, and they made um, Josiah, his son, king in his place. And verse 1 of Second Chronicles 34 says, Josiah was eight years old when he became king and reigned 31 years in Jerusalem. He did what was right in the Lord's sight and walked in the ways of his ancestors, David. He did not turn aside to the right or to the left. So this is just kind of a summation of Josiah's life. And um, it says in the eighth year of his reign, so he's 16 years old, 16 years old, he began to seek the God of his ancestor David. And in the twelfth year, he began to cleanse Judah and Jerusalem of the high places, the Asherah poles, the carved images, the cast images, and and he goes on talks about his his reforms, and and this is the sort of thing that I think Nahum is talking about in verse two 
of chapter 2 in the book of Nahum, that, that um, in order to bless God's people, he will bring judgment, which is a righteous judgment, on those who have um, conspired against his people. And so God acts on our behalf. But it's always in the context or, or setting up of a circumstance like this where Josiah, uh, you know, did this, this time of focus. Was it, um, was it um, spurred on by the, by the time of peace, by the, the fact that Assyria was no longer a threat to them and they could focus on internal things? Or, or did, and that's, I think, I think God knew that Josiah was going to be somebody. And and so judgment is coming to Judah. And judgment comes on all disobedience. And and those who reject God's jurisdiction and and God's standard. But but there's the circumstance that exists now to where uh, God allows uh, Judah to live in relative peace And Josiah is able to bring about reforms that uh, are necessary and um, and help to to bring the 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 country of Judah into uh, a place of health and and faithfulness to God. So that's that's why God acts. That's the things that He does. He gives His people a chance to to come forth and be faithful and to be influencers of others, as Josiah did here. As we move on, uh, the, uh, the situation for Nineveh is desperate, beginning in verse 3 of our text. Uh, The shields of his warriors are dyed red. The valiant men are dressed in scarlet. The fittings of the chariot flash like fire on the day of its battle preparations, and the spears are brandished. The chariots dash madly through the streets. They rush around in the plazas. They look like torches. They They dart back and forth like lightning. He gives orders to his officers, they stumble as they advance. They race to the wall. The projective shield is set in place. The river gates are opened and the palace erodes away. Uh, this is the situation now in the city of Nineveh. Uh, we have uh, this army in red that is now approaching uh, the, the city of Nineveh as they look off their uh, as, as they look over the walls and they see the enemy coming, and they see is, see the sea of red. Uh, the uh, and this was a a color of the Medes and the the Chaldeans, their uniforms. And I suppose it was intended to intimidate. It was intended to create fear in the hearts of those that they were going up against. Uh, the the color red is often a color in scripture for war and bloodshed. And it was creating a very chaotic scene in the city. And, and I've, I've uh, written on the bullet point here, this is, this is our real situation. Sometimes uh, we, we get the feeling that the things of this world and the institutions of this world are going to bring us peace and comfort, and contentment. But, but really, uh, there is an enemy that, that is always against God's people, that is always against us, and, and if we can look and see it for what it really is, the situation, there's no contentment, peace, uh, uh, there, there's chaos, there's, there's intimidation, there's desperate situations. The, uh, the army of the of the uh, of the, the the king of uh, Assyria is he's he's trying to get his his warriors into place, but there's just too much going on. That's it's it's overwhelming, and, and and that's that's kind of how life feels sometimes. It just gets to a point to where it's overwhelming, and all we see is is danger and and chaos. Uh, but God's people. Uh, 
have to look at things differently. Uh, there is uh, some specific uh, a prophecy, I guess, that that Nahum talks about. And, and of course, whenever there's maybe a specific statement in Scripture, the the uh, the skeptics are going to try and and do away with it. Uh, but there are some discussions by historians of of what has happened. Uh, this is the, the the city walls of Nineveh. We pretty much know uh, from archaeology that's there. We have it's on the east bank of the Tigris River, and so that's a that's a mighty river in their place. And and they have this this city uh, or this river that winds through the city. Now. That seems like a good idea, huh? To have a river flowing through your city. Uh, uh, many of our great cities in America have rivers flowing through it. Uh, it you know, it must have been beautiful. Uh, um, in San Antonio, if you've been to San Antonio and done the river walk, it's, it's beautiful to sit in the boats and go down and watch people uh, eat their food and, and enjoy life and and I, I suspect there's something, there's some, something related to the ambiance of, of the, the water going through the city and the beauty of it. Uh, here is, uh, the royal palace. And, uh, and, and what they said was that, uh, the, the Tigris was in flood stage. Uh, and Nahum seems to suggest something like that, that this is an overwhelming circumstance. The Tigris was in flood stage. It backs up uh, down the, the Kosar River, uh, and, um, and it undermines their, their palace, their fortification, the, the symbol of their strength. And once the walls begin to fall, it's easy for the enemy to, to come in. And, and really that's kind of where we're going this evening is, is that humans, because they reject the jurisdiction of God and the standards of God in their life, we often have to build something else. We have to put something else in its place to, to trust, to lean upon, to give life meaning. And, and every time, if it isn't God and his, the truths of his word that we trust in, it's going to crumble and it's going to fall. The, the next passage, uh, the next section talks about um, verse 7. Beauty is stripped. She is carried away. Her ladies in waiting moan like the sound of doves and the beat and the, and beat their breasts. Nineveh has been like a pool of water from her first days, but they are fleeing. Stop, stop, they cry, but no one turns back. Plunder the silver, plunder the gold. There is no end to the treasure and abundance of every precious thing. Verses seven through nine indict us. Indict the human family. Because oftentimes it's these things, it's, it's wealth, it's, it's glamour, it's, um, it's Hollywood. It is all of the things that society values. That's really kind of, if you look at it from one perspective, it's kind of cheap and, and tawdry and it's, and we know uh, wealth is fleeting, it comes and goes, but for some reason we still are attracted to it. That stuff gets our attention. Uh, what makes Hollywood the, um, uh, the, the philosophical trendsetters in our society? What, what qualifies them to advise everyone else how to live? And of course the answer is, uh, they really don't have any qualifications, but they look good. They smell good. Uh, they're beautiful. They're, they're handsome. They're gorgeous. The, and, and we, uh, we listen to what they have to say. And, and we are stunned when it all falls because we put 
so much hope in these things. And, and I believe Christians, you know, this is a message to God's people. I, I believe that's why when we read the history of Judah, that's part of this cycle. Uh, we, uh, we realize we've done wrong. The, the, the God who has jurisdiction to, to judge us and, and has manifest to us the standard by which to live our lives, he acts and, and, and this chaos and things fall apart and we repent and we realize what we've done. But then, what gets us back to the other side of the cycle where we're not obeying? We're not paying attention. I think part of it is that the voices of our society are so attractive and so alluring. And, and they're, they're rich. Isn't it the rich people who know what they're talking about? Isn't that kind of what we say? And then we're stunned when it just goes away. What do we trust in? What do we put our hope in? What do we value? What do we think is important? Because wealth will be a witness, but it'll be a witness for the state against God's people because we often are guilty of trusting those things and putting our hope in those things. The passage ends up (laughs) kind of mocking Nineveh, mocking the Assyrians. Verse 10, desolation, decimation, devastation, hearts melt, knees tremble, loins shake, every face grows pale. Where is the lion's lair or the feeding ground of the young lions? Where the lion and the lioness prowled and the lion's cub with nothing to frighten them away. The lion mauled whatever its cubs needed and strangled its prey for its lionesses. It filled up its dens with the kill and its lairs with the mauled prey. Uh, Beware, I am against you. This is the declaration of the Lord of hosts. I will make your chariots go up in smoke. The sword will devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth and the sound of your messengers will never be heard again. On the right is a Lamasu. Is that how you say it? Yeah, a Lamasu. It is a one of their deities, one of the Assyrian deities. It kind of looks like a man and kind of looks like an eagle and kind of looks like a lion. And, and this was one of the, the guards to, to their, their pagan temples. Uh, on, the, on the left is uh, a picture of the last king of uh, Assyria. Not the last king, but the last strong king. He was Ashurpanipal. And he had many uh, things like this in his temples and in his palace, these reliefs where... It depicts him uh, conquering the, the wildest of beasts. And, and he, uh, he sees himself and he sees his ability to kill the lions as, as testimony to his strength. And so the lion was uh, characteristic and defined the, uh, the people of Assyria. Uh, this is in one of his chronicles. He, he writes, uh, among men, kings, and among the beasts, Lions were powerless before my bow. I know the art of waging battle and combat. A valiant hero, beloved of Asher and Ishtar, it's a couple of their gods, of royal image am I. <laughs> so he's, he's kind of humble. You could see he's, he's, uh, he's a very humble individual. But uh, really you can see the pride and you can see the arrogance and, and the utter dependence on what he thinks is his strength. And this is just characteristic of even people today that that we trust in in the since uh, if we've if we've not submitted ourselves to the jurisdiction and the standard of God's judgment in our lives we replace it with something and this is what the Assyrians replaced it with and 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 as i said at the at the end of this chapter he just kind of mocks 
what they put their strength, what they depended on, what they put their trust in. And it, again, it, it just it asks us to ask ourselves the question, what do we trust in? There, there is, uh, I, I thought about, you know, how would this maybe or could this specifically speak to our situation as, as people in a country that uh, was founded on Christian principles? Uh, I think we have definitely strayed from those Christian principles, but, uh, but we still uh, have these symbols in our national discussion that, uh, that point to this heritage. Um, definitely on our money, it says, in God we trust. Um, uh, though we wouldn't necessarily, um, wouldn't necessarily join the movement, but there are some people who would like to take this off the money uh, so that we can... Uh, maintain the wall of separation of church and state between uh, these two entities and and do away with religion but but what i thought what i thought is is what americans probably trust most is just in this concept of freedom and this concept of freedom and um and and though i i pray that this statement would be true for all of us in god we trust um, oftentimes our actions say something else. And, and so to listen to the message of Nahum in, in Nahum chapter 2, uh, that, um, that as God's people, um, we realize freedom is an important element. And, um, and it's something that's, that's worthy of fighting and, and, and dying for. Um, but God has given us freedom. And, and as we close out our time together uh, to focus on, on these two verses, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16, as God's slaves live as free people, I, that, uh, that paradox that's created there. Um, we are free, but we're not free to do whatever we want to do. We are free uh, it says, but don't use your freedom as a way to conceal evil. And I think that's a strong message to our country today. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 13, For you were called to be free, brothers, only don't use this freedom as an opportunity by the, uh, for the flesh, but to serve one another through love. I believe that was Bob's message this past Wednesday night, that, um, uh, that we have been given an amazing gift of freedom, um, by God, and and to use that gift, uh, that freedom, not for ourselves, not to indulge ourselves or to benefit ourselves, but to serve others.